Welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of Pragmatism. A new name for some old ways of thinking. Popular Lectures on Philosophy by William James 1906-1907. Lecture 5. Pragmatism and Common Sense. In the last lecture we turned ourselves from the usual way of talking of the universe's oneness as a principle, sublime in all its blankness, towards a study of the special kinds of union which the universe enfolds. We found many of these to coexist with kinds of separation equally real. How far am I verified, is the question which each kind of union and each kind of separation asks us here, so as good pragmatists we have to turn our face towards experience, towards facts. Absolute oneness remains, but only as an hypothesis. And that hypothesis is reduced nowadays to that of an omniscient knower who sees all things without exception as forming one single systematic fact. But the knower in question may still be conceived either as an absolute or as an ultimate, and over against the hypothesis of him in either form the counter-hypothesis that the widest field of knowledge that ever was or will be still contain some ignorance, may be legitimately held. Some bits of information always may escape. This is the hypothesis of noetic pluralism, which monists consider so absurd, since we are bound to treat it as respectfully as noetic monism, until the facts shall have tipped the beam, we find that our pragmatism, though originally nothing but a method, has forced us to be friendly to the pluralistic view. It may be that some parts of the world are connected so loosely with some other parts as to be strung along by nothing but the copula and. They might even come and go without those other parts suffering any internal change. This pluralistic view, of a world of additive constitution, is one that pragmatism is unable to rule out from serious consideration. But this view leads one to the farther hypothesis that the actual world, instead of being complete, eternally, as the monists assure us, may be eternally incomplete, and at all times subject to addition or liable to loss. It is at any rate incomplete in one respect, and flagrantly so. The very fact that we debate this question shows that our knowledge is incomplete at present and subject to addition. In respect of the knowledge it contains the world does genuinely change and grow. Some general remarks on the way in which our knowledge completes itself, when it does complete itself, will lead us very conveniently into our subject for this lecture, which is, common sense. To begin with, our knowledge grows in spots. The spots may be large or small, but the knowledge never grows all over, some old knowledge always remains what it was. Your knowledge of pragmatism, let us suppose, is growing now. Later, its growth may involve considerable modification of opinions which you previously held to be true. But such modifications are apt to be gradual. To take the nearest possible example, consider these lectures of mine. What you first gain from them is probably a small amount of new information, a few new definitions, or distinctions, or points of view. But while these special ideas are being added, the rest of your knowledge stands still, and only gradually will you, line up, your previous opinions with the novelties I am trying to instill, and modify to some slight degree their mass. You listen to me now, I suppose, with certain prepossessions as to my competency, and these affect your reception of what I say. But were I suddenly to break off lecturing, and to begin to sing, we won't go home till morning, 
in a rich baritone voice, not only would that new fact be added to your stock, but it would oblige you to define me differently, and that might alter your opinion of the pragmatic philosophy, and in general bring about a rearrangement of a number of your ideas. Your mind in such processes is strained, and sometimes painfully so, between its older beliefs and the novelties which experience brings along. Our minds thus grow in spots, and like grease spots, the spots spread. But we let them spread as little as possible, we keep unaltered as much of our old knowledge, as many of our old prejudices and beliefs, as we can. We patch and tinker more than we renew. The novelty soaks in, it stains the ancient mass, but it is also tinged by what absorbs it. Our past apperceives and cooperates, and in the new equilibrium in which each step forward in the process of learning terminates, it happens relatively seldom that the new fact is added raw. More usually it is embedded cooked, as one might say, or stewed down in the sauce of the old. New truths thus are resultants of new experiences and of old truths combined and mutually modifying one another. And since this is the case in the changes of opinion of today, there is no reason to assume that it has not been so at all times. It follows that very ancient modes of thought may have survived through all the later changes in men's opinions. The most primitive ways of thinking may not yet be wholly expunged. Like our five fingers, our ear bones, our rudimentary caudal appendage, or our other vestigial peculiarities, they may remain as indelible tokens of events in our race history. Our ancestors may at certain moments have struck into ways of thinking which they might conceivably not have found. But once they did so, and after the fact, the inheritance continues. When you begin a piece of music in a certain key, you must keep the key to the end. You may alter your house ad libitum, but the ground plan of the first architect persists, you can make great changes, but you cannot change a Gothic church into a Doric temple. You may rinse and rinse the bottle, but you can't get the taste of the medicine or whiskey that first filled it wholly out. My thesis now is this that our fundamental ways of thinking about things are discoveries of exceedingly remote ancestors, which have been able to preserve themselves throughout the experience of all subsequent time. They form one great stage of equilibrium in the human mind's development, the stage of common sense. Other stages have grafted themselves upon this stage, but have never succeeded in displacing it. Let us consider this common sense stage first, as if it might be final. In practical talk, a man's common sense means his good judgment, his freedom from eccentricity, his gumption, to use the vernacular word. In philosophy it means something entirely different, it means his use of certain intellectual forms or categories of thought. Were we lobsters, or bees, it might be that our organization would have led to our using quite different modes from these of apprehending our experiences. It might be too, we cannot dogmatically deny this, that such categories, unimaginable by us today, would have proved on the whole as serviceable for handling our experiences mentally as those which we actually use. If this sounds paradoxical to anyone, let him think of analytical geometry. The identical figures which Euclid defined by intrinsic relations were defined by Descartes by the relations of their points to adventitious coordinates, the result being an absolutely different and vastly more potent way of handling curves. All our conceptions are what the Germans call Denkmittel, means by which we handle facts by thinking them. Experience merely as such doesn't come ticketed and labeled, we have first to discover what it is. Kant speaks of it as being in its first intention a goal der Erstgenungen, a rhapsody der Warn, a mere motley which we have to unify by our wits. What we usually do is first to frame some system of concepts mentally classified, serialized, or connected in some intellectual way, and then to use this as a tally by which we keep tab on the impressions that present themselves. When each is referred to some possible place in the conceptual system, 
It is thereby, understood, this notion of parallel manifolds, with their elements standing reciprocally in one-to-one -one relations, is proving so convenient nowadays in mathematics and logic as to supersede more and more the older classificatory conceptions. There are many conceptual systems of this sort, and the sense manifold is also such a system. Find a one-to-one -one relation for your sense impressions anywhere among the concepts, and in so far forth you rationalize the impressions. But obviously you can rationalize them by using various conceptual systems. The old common sense way of rationalizing them is by a set of concepts of which the most important are these. Thing. The same or different. Kinds. Minds. Bodies. One time. One space. Subjects and attributes. Causal influences. The fancied. The real. We are now so familiar with the order that these notions have woven for us out of the everlasting weather of our perceptions that we find it hard to realize how little of a fixed routine the perceptions follow when taken by themselves. The word weather is a good one to use here. In Boston, for example, the weather has almost no routine, the only law being that if you have had any weather for two days, you will probably but not certainly have another weather on the third. Weather experience as it thus comes to Boston, is discontinuous and chaotic. In point of temperature, of wind, rain or sunshine, it may change three times a day. But the Washington Weather Bureau intellectualizes this disorder by making each successive bit of Boston weather episodic. It refers it to its place and moment in a continental cyclone, on the history of which the local changes everywhere are strung as beads are strung upon a cord. Now it seems almost certain that young children and the inferior animals take all their experiences very much as uninstructed Bostonians take their weather. They know no more of time or space as world receptacles, or of permanent subjects and changing predicates, or of causes, or kinds, or thoughts, or things, than our common people know of continental cyclones. A baby's rattle drops out of his hand, but the baby looks not for it. It has gone out for him, as a candle flame goes out, and it comes back, when you replace it in his hand, as the flame comes back when relit. The idea of its being a thing, whose permanent existence by itself he might interpolate between its successive apparitions has evidently not occurred to him. It is the same with dogs. Out of sight, out of mind, with them. It is pretty evident that they have no general tendency to interpolate things, let me quote here a passage from my colleague G. Santayana's book. If a dog, while sniffing about contentedly, sees afar off his master arriving after long absence, the poor brute asks for no reason why his master went, why he has come again, why he should be loved, or why presently while lying at his feet you forget him and begin to grunt and dream of the chase, all that is an utter mystery, utterly unconsidered. Such experience has variety, scenery, and a certain vital rhythm, its story might be told in dithyrambic verse. It moves wholly by inspiration, every event is providential, every act unpremeditated. Absolute freedom and absolute helplessness have met together, you depend wholly on divine favor, yet that unfathomable agency is not distinguishable from your own life. But, the figures even of that disordered drama have their exits and their entrances, and their cues can be gradually discovered by a being capable of fixing his attention and retaining the order of events. In proportion as such understanding advances each moment of experience becomes consequential and prophetic of the rest. The calm places in life are filled with power and its spasms with resource. No emotion can overwhelm the mind, for of none is the basis or issue wholly hidden, no event can disconcert it altogether, because it sees beyond. Means can be looked for to escape from the worst predicament, and whereas each moment had been formerly filled with nothing but its own adventure and surprised emotion, 
each now makes room for the lesson of what went before and surmises what may be the plot of the whole. Footnote, The Life of Reason, Reason in Common Sense, 1905, page 59. Even today science and philosophy are still laboriously trying to part fancies from realities in our experience, and in primitive times they made only the most incipient distinctions in this line. Men believed whatever they thought with any liveliness, and they mixed their dreams with their realities inextricably. The categories of thought and things are indispensable here, instead of being realities we now call certain experiences only thoughts, there is not a category, among those enumerated, of which we may not imagine the use to have thus originated historically and only gradually spread. That one time which we all believe in and in which each event has its definite date, that one space in which each thing has its position, these abstract notions unify the world incomparably, but in their finished shape as concepts how different they are from the loose unordered time and space experiences of natural men. Everything that happens to us brings its own duration and extension, and both are vaguely surrounded by a marginal, more, that runs into the duration and extension of the next thing that comes. But we soon lose all our definite bearings, and not only do our children make no distinction between yesterday and the day before yesterday, the whole past being churned up together, but we adults still do so whenever the times are large. It is the same with spaces. On a map I can distinctly see the relation of London, Constantinople, and Pekin to the place where I am, in reality I utterly fail to feel the facts which the map symbolizes. The directions and distances are vague, confused and mixed. Cosmic space and cosmic time, so far from being the intuitions that Kant said they were, are constructions as patently artificial as any that science can show. The great majority of the human race never use these notions, but live in plural times and spaces, interpenetrant and durchenander. Permanent things again, the th same thing in its various appearances and alterations, the different kinds of thing, with the th kind used finally as a predicate, of which the thing remains the th subject, what a straightening of the tangle of our experiences immediate flux and sensible variety does this list of terms suggest. And it is only the smallest part of his experiences flux that anyone actually does straighten out by applying to it these conceptual instruments. Out of them all our lowest ancestors probably used only, and then most vaguely and inaccurately, the notion of the same again, but even then if you had asked them whether the same were a thing that had endured throughout the unseen interval, they would probably have been at a loss, and would have said that they had never asked that question, or considered matters in that light. Kinds, and sameness of kind, what colossally useful denkmittel for finding our way among the many. The manyness might conceivably have been absolute. Experiences might have all been singulars, no one of them occurring twice. In such a world logic would have had no application, for kind and sameness of kind are logic's only instruments. Once we know that whatever is of a kind is also of that kind's kind, we can travel through the universe as if with seven league boots. Brutes surely never use these abstractions, and civilized men use them in most various amounts. Causal influence, again. This, if anything, seems to have been an antediluvian conception, for we find primitive men thinking that almost everything is significant and can exert influence of some sort. The search for the more definite influences seems to have started in the question, who, or what, is to blame? For any illness, namely, or disaster, or untoward thing. From this center the search for causal influences has spread. Hume and science together have tried to eliminate the whole notion of influence, substituting the entirely different denkmittel of law but law is a comparatively recent invention, and influence reigns supreme in the older realm of common sense. The possible, as something less than the actual and more than the wholly unreal.
is another of these magisterial notions of common sense. Criticize them as you may, they persist, and we fly back to them the moment critical pressure is relaxed. Self, body, in the substantial or metaphysical sense, no one escapes subjection to those forms of thought. In practice, the common sense denkmittel are uniformly victorious. Everyone, however instructed, still thinks of a thing, in the common sense way, as a permanent unit subject that supports its attributes interchangeably. No one stably or sincerely uses the more critical notion of a group of sense qualities united by a law. With these categories in our hand, we make our plans and plot together, and connect all the remoter parts of experience with what lies before our eyes. Our later and more critical philosophies are mere fads and fancies compared with this natural mother tongue of thought. Common sense appears thus as a perfectly definite stage in our understanding of things, a stage that satisfies in an extraordinarily successful way the purposes for which we think. Things do exist, even when we do not see them. Their kinds also exist. Their qualities are what they act by, and are what we act on, and these also exist. These lamps shed their quality of light on every object in this room. We intercept it on its way whenever we hold up an opaque screen. It is the very sound that my lips emit that travels into your ears. It is the sensible heat of the fire that migrates into the water in which we boil an egg, and we can change the heat into coolness by dropping in a lump of ice. At this stage of philosophy all non-European men without exception have remained. It suffices for all the necessary practical ends of life, and, among our own race even, it is only the highly sophisticated specimens, the minds debauched by learning, as Berkeley calls them, who have ever even suspected common sense of not being absolutely true. But when we look back, and speculate as to how the common sense categories may have achieved their wonderful supremacy, no reason appears why it may not have been by a process just like that by which the conceptions due to Democritus, Berkeley, or Darwin achieved their similar triumphs in more recent times. In other words, they may have been successfully discovered by prehistoric geniuses whose names the night of antiquity has covered up, they may have been verified by the immediate facts of experience which they first fitted, and then from fact to fact and from man to man they may have spread, until all language rested on them and we are now incapable of thinking naturally in any other terms. Such a view would only follow the rule that has proved elsewhere so fertile, of assuming the vast and remote to conform to the laws of formation that we can observe at work in the small and near. For all utilitarian practical purposes these conceptions amply suffice, but that they began at special points of discovery and only gradually spread from one thing to another, seems proved by the exceedingly dubious limits of their application today. We assume for certain purposes one objective time that equabiliter flood, but we don't livingly believe in or realize any such equally flowing time. Space is a less vague notion, but things, what are they? Is a constellation properly a thing? Or an army? Or is an ens rationis such as space or justice a thing? Is a knife whose handle and blade are changed the same? Is the changeling, whom Locke so seriously discusses, of the human kind? Is telepathy a fancy or a fact? The moment you pass beyond the practical use of these categories, a use usually suggested sufficiently by the circumstances of the special case, to a merely curious or speculative way of thinking, you find it impossible to say within just what limits of fact any one of them shall apply. The peripatetic philosophy, obeying rationalist propensities, has tried to eternalize the common sense categories by treating them very technically and articulately. A thing, for instance, is a being, or ends. An ends is a subject in which qualities inhere, a subject is a substance. Substances are of kinds, and kinds are definite in number and discrete. 
These distinctions are fundamental and eternal. As terms of discourse they are indeed magnificently useful, but what they mean, apart from their use in steering our discourse to profitable issues, does not appear. If you ask a scholastic philosopher what a substance may be in itself, apart from its being the support of attributes, he simply says that your intellect knows perfectly what the word means. But what the intellect knows clearly is only the word itself and its steering function. So it comes about that intellect sibi permissi, intellects only curious and idle, have forsaken the common sense level for what in general terms may be called the critical level of thought. Not merely such intellects either, your Humes and Berkeleys and Hegels, but practical observers of facts, your Galileos, Daltons, Faradays, have found it impossible to treat the naive sense termini of common sense as ultimately real. As common sense interpolates her constant things between our intermittent sensations, so science extrapolates her world of primary qualities, her atoms, her ether, her magnetic fields, and the like, beyond the common sense world. The things are now invisible impalpable things, and the old visible common sense things are supposed to result from the mixture of these invisibles. Or else the whole naive conception of thing gets superseded, and a thing's name is interpreted as denoting only the law or regel der Verbindung by which certain of our sensations habitually succeed or coexist. Science and critical philosophy thus burst the bounds of common sense. With science naive realism ceases, secondary qualities become unreal, primary ones alone remain. With critical philosophy, Havoc is made of everything. The common sense categories one and all cease to represent anything in the way of being, they are but sublime tricks of human thought, our ways of escaping bewilderment in the midst of sensation's irremediable flow. But the scientific tendency in critical thought, though inspired at first by purely intellectual motives, has opened an entirely unexpected range of practical utilities to our astonished view. Galileo gave us accurate clocks and accurate artillery practice, the chemists flood us with new medicines and dye stuffs, Ampere and Faraday have endowed us with the New York subway and with Marconi telegrams. The hypothetical things that such men have invented, defined as they have defined them, are showing an extraordinary fertility in consequences verifiable by sense. Our logic can deduce from them a consequence due under certain conditions, we can then bring about the conditions, and presto, the consequence is there before our eyes. The scope of the practical control of nature newly put into our hand by scientific ways of thinking vastly exceeds the scope of the old control grounded on common sense. Its rate of increase accelerates so that no one can trace the limit one may even fear that the being of man may be crushed by his own powers, that his fixed nature as an organism may not prove adequate to stand the strain of the ever-increasingly tremendous functions, almost divine creative functions, which his intellect will more and more enable him to wield. He may drown in his wealth like a child in a bathtub, who has turned on the water and who cannot turn it off. The philosophic stage of criticism, much more thorough in its negations than the scientific stage, so far gives us no new range of practical power. Locke, Hume, Berkeley, Kant, Hegel, have all been utterly sterile, so far as shedding any light on the details of nature goes, and I can think of no invention or discovery that can be directly traced to anything in their peculiar thought, for neither with Berkeley's tarwater nor with Kant's nebular hypothesis had their respective philosophic tenets anything to do. The satisfactions they yield to their disciples are intellectual, not practical, and even then we have to confess that there is a large minus side to the account. There are thus at least three well-characterized levels, stages or types of thought about the world we live in, and the notions of one stage have one kind of merit, those of another stage another kind. It is impossible, however, to say that any stage as yet in sight is absolutely more true than any other. 
Common sense is the more consolidated stage, because it got its innings first, and made all language into its ally. Whether it or science be the more august stage may be left to private judgment. But neither consolidation nor augustness are decisive marks of truth. If common sense were true, why should science have had to brand the secondary qualities, to which our world owes all its living interest, as false, and to invent an invisible world of points and curves and mathematical equations instead? Why should it have needed to transform causes and activities into laws of functional variation? Vainly did scholasticism, common sense's college-trained younger sister, seek to stereotype the forms the human family had always talked with, to make them definite and fix them for eternity. Substantial forms, in other words our secondary qualities, hardly outlasted the year of our Lord 1600. People were already tired of them then, and Galileo, and Descartes, with his new philosophy, gave them only a little later their coup de grace. But now if the new kinds of scientific thing, the corpuscular and etheric world, were essentially more to true, why should they have excited so much criticism within the body of science itself? Scientific logicians are saying on every hand that these entities and their determinations, however definitely conceived, should not be held for literally real. It is as if they existed, but in reality they are like coordinates or logarithms. Only artificial shortcuts for taking us from one part to another of experience's flux. We can cipher fruitfully with them, they serve us wonderfully, but we must not be their dupes. There is no ringing conclusion possible when we compare these types of thinking, with a view to telling which is the more absolutely true. Their naturalness, their intellectual economy, their fruitfulness for practice, all start up as distinct tests of their veracity, and as a result we get confused. Common sense is better for one sphere of life, science for another, philosophic criticism for a third, but whether either be truer absolutely, heaven only knows. Just now, if I understand the matter rightly, we are witnessing a curious reversion to the common sense way of looking at physical nature, in the philosophy of science favored by such men as Mach, Ostwald, and Duhem. According to these teachers no hypothesis is truer than any other in the sense of being a more literal copy of reality. They are all but ways of talking on our part, to be compared solely from the point of view of their use. The only literally true thing is reality, and the only reality we know is, for these logicians, sensible reality, the flux of our sensations and emotions as they pass. Energy is the collective name, according to Ostwald, for the sensations just as they present themselves, the movement, heat, magnetic pull, or light, or whatever it may be, when they are measured in certain ways. So measuring them, we are enabled to describe the correlated changes which they show us, in formulas matchless for their simplicity and fruitfulness for human use. They are sovereign triumphs of economy in thought. No one can fail to admire that energetic philosophy. But the hypersensible entities, the corpuscles and vibrations, hold their own with most physicists and chemists, in spite of its appeal. It seems too economical to be all-sufficient. Profusion, not economy, may after all be reality's keynote. I am dealing here with highly technical matters, hardly suitable for popular lecturing, and in which my own competence is small. All the better for my conclusion, however, which at this point is this. The whole notion of truth, which naturally and without reflection we assume to mean the simple duplication by the mind of a ready-made and given reality, proves hard to understand clearly. There is no simple test available for adjudicating offhand between the divers types of thought that claim to possess it. Common sense, common science or corpuscular philosophy, ultracritical science, or energetics, and critical or idealistic philosophy, all seem insufficiently true in some regard and leave some dissatisfaction. 
It is evident that the conflict of these so widely differing systems obliges us to overhaul the very idea of truth, for at present we have no definite notion of what the word may mean. I shall face that task in my next lecture, and will add but a few words, in finishing the present one. There are only two points that I wish you to retain from the present lecture. The first one relates to common sense. We have seen reason to suspect it, to suspect that in spite of their being so venerable, of their being so universally used and built into the very structure of language, its categories may after all be only a collection of extraordinarily successful hypotheses, historically discovered or invented by single men, but gradually communicated, and used by everybody, by which our forefathers have from time immemorial unified and straightened the discontinuity of their immediate experiences, and put themselves into an equilibrium with the surface of nature so satisfactory for ordinary practical purposes that it certainly would have lasted forever, but for the excessive intellectual vivacity of Democritus, Archimedes, Galileo, Berkeley, and other eccentric geniuses whom the example of such men inflamed. Retain, I pray you, this suspicion about common sense. The other point is this. Ought not the existence of the various types of thinking which we have reviewed, each so splendid for certain purposes, yet all conflicting still, and neither one of them able to support a claim of absolute veracity, to awaken a presumption favorable to the pragmatistic view that all our theories are instrumental, our mental modes of adaptation to reality, rather than revelations or Gnostic answers to some divinely instituted world enigma? I expressed this view as clearly as I could in the second of these lectures. Certainly the restlessness of the actual theoretic situation, the value for some purposes of each thought level, and the inability of either to expel the others decisively, suggest this pragmatistic view, which I hope that the next lectures may soon make entirely convincing. May there not after all be a possible ambiguity in truth? Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.